Hello, welcome to our webinar today to demonstrate South Africa's National Environmental Screening Tool. Thank you for your patience. We had some brief technical difficulties at the beginning, but we're all set to go now and excited for a great webinar to demonstrate this to you. My name is Bridget John and I will be your moderator today. Our webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment to make informed decisions. And a shout out as well to our South African affiliate, IAIA South Africa, who was key and instrumental in getting this webinar to happen. Uh, today's presentation is part of a webinar program that IAIA initiated last year, and I invite you to visit our website to check out some of the recordings of a um, few of our recent webinars. Some of them are listed on the screen, but there are definitely more in a variety of topic areas. You'll see there biodiversity, indigenous peoples, um, project implementation, psychosocial impact assessment, health, resettlement, and more. So you see our site listed there. And and if you are on social media and you want to tweet out or uh, mention anything um, that you've heard today, feel free to do that. You'll see IAIA's Twitter handle there, and our hashtag is IAIA webinar. Just a few items of housekeeping before we get jumping into the presentation itself. We are indeed recording the webinar today, recognizing not everybody can participate in it live. We will make that available to everybody who has registered on our website and put that on our website. Um, everyone who's registered will receive a link to that in the next day or two. Um, following a brief introduction of the tool, we will have an online demonstration and then at the end there will be about a half an hour for questions. So there is a control panel on the right side of your screen and there is a, a tab for questions. So feel free to enter your questions at any time throughout the presentation. I'll be moderating and looking for, through those as they come in and I will be asking those to our presenters at the end. Also, the slides for today's webinar are indeed available in the handouts tab of your control panel. Because it's an online interactive presentation, there aren't too many slides, but they, the ones we do have are available for you to download. Our presenter, main presenter today is Dion Murray. Dion is a GIS practitioner responsible for GIS systems at the South Africa Department of Environmental Affairs, or the DEA, of course. Dion is part of the team involved in the system development of the screening tool. When Dion is done with his presentation and demonstration, he will be joined by Dee, Marlene, and Zacharia, all from the DEA for the question and answer session. I'll introduce them more properly when we get to that part of the webinar. But for now, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dion to get us started. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you very much for this opportunity to host this session today from the DEA side. Bridget, just a word of thanks from the international IA, IA team, as well as uh, closer to home to Sue, uh, from the local um, IAIA team. And I just would like to extend a word of appreciation also to the DEA team, the Department of Environmental Affairs team here in Pretoria, um, whom I'm representing today, and for the hours of work and everything that went into this national web-based environmental screening tool. And may I also just thank our ESRI colleagues as well, who actually spent hours in preparation and liaison and uh, communicating with us in order to come up with a screening tool. And last but not least, I would really like to welcome everybody that's following this webinar today. We appreciate your interest and I really hope and believe that the tool will really benefit you in creating a better environment for all aligned with our constitution that states in section 24 that all persons have a right to an environment that isn't harmful to their health or well-being and focus on the preservation and conservation of our natural resources and i really hope that the screening tool and the reports that you will provide uh, from the screening tool may be able to assist you in creating that balance between conservation and economic growth. 
So I am briefly just going to use three slides to introduce the national web-based environmental screening tool. And then I'm going to proceed on to a live demonstration of the screening tool. Just before I start that, I just want to note and thank you, Bridget, for the information that you sent to date. Uh, based on the questions that you answered when you actually registered for this webinar, it became clear to me that on the question, how familiar are you with the South African environmental impact assessment process? About 72% of the people that registered indicated very familiar, 22% somewhat familiar, and only 6% not familiar. However, on the question, how familiar are you with the South African screening tool, the, the charge was turned around because 5% indicated very familiar, whereas 42% somewhat, 53% not at all. So we've got about a 95% amount of people on the webinar that's not so familiar with the screening tool. And I'm usually also interested in how many people are actually familiar with or skilled in GIS. And the figures uh, more or less tally to about 20% very skilled, 50% somewhat skilled, and 24% not skilled. Now, the good news today is that you do not need to be a skilled GIS user to be able to use the national screening tool. And that's the whole reason for making this to an online web enabled um, application so that anybody can actually use the tool at their own leisure as an online tool. So let's move to the first screen. What is the screening tool? And I'm going to just pause, uh, attending a little bit of time on the first bullet. The National Web-Based Environmental Screening Tool is a geospatial web-enabled application providing for screening of sites for environmental sensitivity and then the placement of proposed developments in, re in relation to the impact avoidance hierarchy. I would just like to flag a few aspects on this bullet. First of all, the fact that it's a national web-based tool. Ladies and gentlemen, we currently have about 180 national data sets that's part of this process. And that has been conditioned to form part and parcel of the national web-based environmental screening tool. And the whole aim of the exercise is to provide the user with a range of spatially enabled data sets that we receive from custodians, if not captured, captured at the Department of Environmental Affairs, to assist you with data sets that can show sensitivities as well as original data with inherent sensitivities. The second aspect on the screening tool is that it's a web-based screening tool. And I think the two important aspects there being it's on the World Wide Web available, as well as on an HTTPS environment, meaning that you're working in a secure environment. Thirdly, it's an environmental screening tool. So therefore, the focus is on environmental data sets and related data sets in order to support the user to actually get hold of these environmental spatially enabled data sets at their fingertips. The, these data sets might be set such as protected areas, wetlands, CBAs, so-called critically biodiversity areas, and so forth. And then it's a screening tool. And I like to emphasize at this point in time that it's literally a screening tool. So the important part here is I usually compare this with when you're at the airport and you actually go through customs and you move through the scanner the aim of the scanner is actually exactly that, to pick up sensitive uh, objects from a specific vantage point. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here, is to actually identify sensitive data sets from the vantage point that you're trying to determine a site or a footprint in order to eventually uh, proceed with an application. But that in terms of 
the placement of that application according to an impact avoidance hierarchy. So just again to emphasize the screening tool is a screening tool and the user must always realize that it's so important to just move back after creating a report in order to verify the information, do ground truthing and ensure that whatever you find on the screening tool is literally the first step as part of a process. The next bullet simply indicates that the aim of the report is to produce a report uh, or the tool required in terms of regulation 1615 of the EIA regulations. And lastly, I just want to emphasize again that any person can use the screening tool at any time and use it as an anonymous user. The next slide is quite a busy slide, but I believe you will be able to follow a silver line through the slide. In South Africa, the National Development Plan calls for an effective and efficient environmental legislative process, including the environmental impact assessment process. And to follow on this, the development of the national web-based environmental screening tool forms part of ensuring that the ongoing improvement of the EIA process to ensure this efficiency and the effectiveness, I think with a, a, a quite strong focus on the efficiency and the effectiveness of the system. Thirdly, the screening tool aims to flag areas of potential environmental sensitivity. Just as I just mentioned, it's a screening process. It flags areas of potential environmental sensitivity in relation to a proposed site and development footprint. And though, although I will emphasize it again, notice that in the screening tool, you will typically identify a site and then one or more footprint on that site or maybe alternative footprints in order to determine the sensitivity and eventually proceed with the application through the formal channels. The tool also enables the applicant to manipulate the development footprint on a site to avoid environmental sensitivities. And we believe that making spatial data sets available to the user will help immensely to ensure that these sensitivities are taken into account. The report also generates a list of specialist assessments that should form part of the assessment report to be submitted with an EIA application based on the national se sector classification and the sensitivity of the site. This tool also supports the implementation of assessment protocols. And these assessment protocols provide a minimum amount of information or guidelines to be included in a specialist report to facilitate the decision making process. And I will elaborate a little bit more on this when we do the live demonstration. And then the tool identifies any specific exclusions, restrictions, prohibitions or any exceptions to the EIA process that apply to a particular site as well as any specific information that must be consulted in relation to that site. An example might be something such as the air quality priority areas that might be used as a background to the existing site and footprint identified and then indicate whether the, there are ex specific exclusions or restrictions in that specific area. And these data sets will all be in a spatial format. And then lastly, in time to provide a mechanism to collect new environmental information surveyed or compiled by the specialist through the preparation of assessment reports for verification by data custodians for incorporation into the relevant national data sets. I just would like to emphasize at this point in time that we refer to custodians. The data sets that's incorporated into the screening tool are derived from data that's received from custodians. So for example, if we receive data from the uh, Department of Agriculture, 
uh, forestry and fisheries, we will not change any data. We will merely, uh, in um, consultation with the department, add sensitivities and then condition the data set to fill the screening tool or to adhere to the um, expectations of the screening tool. I also want to indicate that data that will become available in future as part of um, assessments that has been done and so on, that we will basically follow a process of incorporating these data into national data sets via the data custodians, because we actually adhere to the STI Act uh, in, the, uh, in South Africa, and that Act actually guides the, the, the process of compiling GIS data sets. And then the last slide as an introduction, just the important URLs. I think most of you already saw the URL, https um, colon dub, um, forward slash forward slash screening dot environment dot gov dot za forward slash screening tool. And this will usually take you to the following URL with the welcome page. And then two other important email addresses which I will also elaborate on a little bit later on, the screening at environment.gov.za email address. Anybody that after this training session struggles with the screening tool or experience certain um, problems, kindly drop us an email and we, we will try and address that as, as soon as possible. And in that same vein, if you've got any queries or questions regarding environmental impact assessments, and the workflows, you are welcome to drop us an email at eiaadmin at environment.gov.za. Good. I'm going to jump right in to the screening tool itself. Let me see, I need that. Okay. Good. I believe everybody can see the screening tool um, first page on the on the system. Actually, Dion, if we could see it briefly, and then it jumped back to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So right now, what we have on screen is the URL page, but now I see it coming back. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. You're welcome. There, perfect. Let me just see if I can expand it to include both screens on my side. Good, are we set to go? Yeah, what, what I see then is currently the screening tool itself, just that. Is that what we're supposed to see? That's 100% correct. Perfect, then you're all set to go. Thank you so much. Good. I believe everybody can now see the screening tool. So after I typed in the screening tool um, URL, this is the first page that you will see. The, the system will guide you through a welcoming process and explain a few aspects about the screening tool itself. I would like to start by just focusing on the lower bottom three panes. First of all, on the left hand side, uh, you will notice what is the screening tool. And in this panel, we will actually provide you information on the screening tool itself. We only have a little short description currently added, screening tool description, and you can kindly peruse any of the information in these panels. In the middle panel, you will notice that it's the latest news panel. I guess this will be one of those more active panels where we will sh share the latest information with all the users of the system. And um, this is also where we'll sh share information in the format of, for example, PDF documents. On the screen, you will notice that I clicked on the link. You can see a typical PDF document, which was opened in the, on the browser. And you can literally at your own leisure, scroll down, peruse the document and I just want to sh note, um, you to take note of something here. This is quite nice. You actually get to a portion in the PDF where you will notice that the document is actually um, in a sort of portrait format. 
you can simply in uh, Chrome browser rotate and then further do the reading. Note at the, at the top, you can download the document, you can print the document, you can zoom in to the documents and so on. Just note at this point in time that it may depend on your um, browser being used, whether it's Internet Explorer, uh, Mozilla Firefox, Chrome, that it might differ from um, browser to browser. I'm going to close the PDF document. We're back in the screening tool. Note that also in the latest news panel, you've got a screening to help. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a, an elaborate screening to function that you can use. And I think many of you might use that, this tool at any later stage. Notice on the left hand side that you can actually expand different panes. All these panes are actually uh, clickable. Let's look at steps, for example. You've got the eight, eight basic steps of the screening process. For example, first of all, you'll tick the disclaimer, you'll go through the category list, identify the site and sensitivity, uh, place the footprint, check the footprint sensitivity, generate a report, and link, link the report to the TIPS process. And one can easily click on any of these options and get more information. I'm just going to close this for the moment, and then on the right bottom, you can see the contact information. There's a few telephone numbers, and then again, the email addresses that you can link on the website assistance and screening tool, currently the same email address. I'm just going to click on one, and it opens an email, screening.environment.gov.za, and you can, at your own leisure, just indicate the challenge that you might experience. And we would always welcome compliments as well. I'm just going to close that email. The last email address in the right panel, EIA process queries, and it will take you to the EIA personnel, and they will actually indicate whether there are specific issues that they can assist with regarding the EIA, EIA process as such. Note that there's a need help button as well in the box, which relates to the screening tool button. Again, uh, assisting you with a lot of information on what's happening behind the scenes and what does the screening tool really entail. And just notice the CA login. You can see the pop-up there, logging as a competent authority. Once the screening tool comes to um, full bloom, if I can call it that, the competent authorities will be able to log in and also get additional information in terms of existing applications, applications uh, that's been um, maybe declined, etc. And then on the left hand side, the critical part, once you agree to the terms and conditions and you tick the relevant box, you can proceed to, to the next screen, which is my next option. So typically, I will tick that I read the terms and conditions. I expect everybody to read the terms and conditions, not as I'm doing currently. And then you will notice that the next button becomes active. I'm going to move to the next screen. This screen is called our screening tool process screen. And this page simply explains those six critical steps in the screening tool process. Again, there's a get more information button. This will give you more information on those six specific steps. And then next to each step, you get have a get more bar that will elaborate information on that specific process. For example, select the national sector classification category and the get more button will actually explain a little bit more why would you go through the process of using the national sector classification category. Right. These six steps are critical as you will use the national sector classification based on the type of activity that you would like to engage in. Once you've passed this process, you will go and identify a site, check the sensitivity of that site, and based on these sensitivities, place a footprint, and then check the sensitivity of the footprint, maybe make some adjustments, and once you're happy that you completed all these steps, 
to generate a report which will be added to your formal application process. Notice on the various screens that buttons such as the home button will simply take you back to the home page, but we would like to get into the thicker of things. So I'm going to click on the next button and the system takes me to the national sector classification category, which is the first step in our process. What we have here is first of all, a bar that will assist us with the whole process of understanding the classification system. Now, what I'm going to do today is I sat in my office the other day and I'm a GIS professional. I'm not an EIA specialist. And I thought, how would I use the system typically? And I actually went back to my childhood days, childhood days and I thought, if I'm in a position that I've got a farm and I would love, love to build a lodge on the farm, how would I go about and using this as an example, I came to this classification system and I thought, how would I use the system to literally place my activity, which is the development of a lodge on the farm? So you will notice if you actually peruse through the system, there are categories. For example, the first type of category will be infrastructure related activities. And then they will be classed in transport and localized infrastructure activities. And it's like a typical hierarchy. So it was easy for me to say, well, the building of a lodge has nothing to do with infrastructure, transport services, road, public, or maybe infrastructure, transport services, canal. And I simply perused through the whole classification system and we believe that we basically with this system covered all types of activities that you need to address. So you will not find a category other at this point in time because we believe all activities should be addressed through the classification system that we currently have. So the only category that made sense to me from a large um, perspective was to actually have a service and that makes a lot of sense a service to people in the hospitality field and I would select this option and notice what will happen it actually um, placed that option in my bar at the top and I've got services and hospitality as my two options here just note if I would click on hospitality there are different options as in the categorization. It could have been waste management services. It could have been burial and cemeteries, water service, hospitality, but I'm interested in a hospitality service. Note what the system did. It actually indicates now that this is a general related methodology. And I'm spending quite a bit of time on this because this is the crux of the system. As the managers of the screening tool, we actually create different methodologies and we're doing this purely because we want to assist the user and not clutter the user system with unnecessary data sets. So we are actually lumping data sets together related to certain methodologies. So in this case, we're going to have a general related methodology. There could be other methodologies such as a wind and solar methodology, for example, which may include a data set or two that's not part of a general related methodology. Note that at this point in time, you can still go back to the home page, but I think it's time to dive a little bit deeper. So let's move on. I'm going to click on the next button and I see a very exciting page at this point in time. So at the top, you will notice you are now viewing the information for the services hospitality application. And you will also notice a list of breadcrumbs at the top, which indicates I ticked the disclaimer, I ticked the select category option, and I'm now at the position where I would like to identify my site. So check site sensitivity, place footprint, check footprint sensitivity, they are all steps to come. Just on the right hand side, notice that there's an, a help documentation a question mark box 
there's also a button on the right hand side that will um, take you to the main menu and then also the button what would you like to do i'll touch on this a little bit later and then certain applications that you can view we'll touch on this a bit later as well so Ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to do is to focus on these three panels because these are the three panes that you're going to use quite thoroughly during the whole screening exercise to determine the sensitivities. And I think it's critical to understand these three panes. On the left hand side, you'll have the layer pane and the add data pane. In the middle, the map page pane. And then on the right hand side, the identify site pane. I'm going to focus in the middle first because this is where you're going to see all your data visually. And notice first of all, if you might experience that this pain is maybe a little bit too focused at this point in time, and you would like to zoom out a little bit, you can zoom out, you can get rid of the left pain by just minimizing it. And you can even get rid of the right pain, pain by minim minimizing it and actually see a full screen. At this, in, this point in time, you can notice that we've got a green line here, which we call our jurisdiction area. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, zoom out a little bit, and just indicate to you that there are two specific jurisdiction areas, the South African Prince Edward Island area, as well as the northern boundary of south africa as well as the eez zone and all our data sets the net national data sets are conditioned for the for this area or areas where applicable another portion that's important will be the navigation tools notice that you've got on the navigation tools here a zoom in but you can also use the scroller on the mouse to simply push forward and it will zoom in and I'm dragging backwards on the wheel and it will scroll out or I can simply click the default extend button. The part that I usually get excited about is the switch base map button. I'm currently on a topographic map, but we also have a link to the S3 base maps and I'm going to click on the imagery map and you will notice you've got access to the imagery, typical as in a Google Earth type of scenario. And these data sets are maintained by ESRI on the World Wide Web. I can simply click the top bar to minimize that option. And just notice once I zoom in the type of background data that's literally at your, at your fingertips uh, um, with the, this, these background maps that's readily available. On the right hand side at the bottom, you will notice we've got a line um, scale also in kilometers and miles, and that will change accordingly. And then a, quite an important button that you will use during the process of determining the sensitivity and adding the site and the footprint is this manage your areas button. Um, I'm going to maybe just quickly demonstrate how that will um, affect you. Let's say, for example, I tick on the draw button on the right hand side. I select a polygon option and I'm going to click, 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 click and double click. And I've got a site and this is an image graph or a graphic image that sits on the screen. But what I currently just quickly want to demonstrate is the moment that I added the site on this manage your areas option, it added a site area. This panel was empty beforehand and you can actually zoom to this area and there's options such as edit geometry. So if I click on geometry, I can literally um, play around with the points and the geometry of the site. It also on the right hand side indicates the coordinates and I can click on coordinates and I can decide to actually delete a coordinate row. And that might be de detrimental to the image um, if I'm not careful. And then lastly, what I can do is I can delete 
this site that I just added. I just wanted to show that quickly so that you understand the value. So in this manage your areas button, you will always have access to your site area as well as the footprints that you add at any stage. And now that I think about it, just remember that if you have a site and you add two or three or more footprints and you delete the site area, you will also delete your footprint areas automatically. Good. I'm just going to expand the panel on the left hand side again. So I think that covers the map pane in the middle. I'm just going to zoom out and I'm going to focus on the layer panel on the left hand side. Just note that the first set of data sets that you actually have access to is more of a placeholder for the, the data that you're going to create. So the site as well as the footprint that you're going to create will be hosted or housed in this environment. I'm just going to expand the button. Notice that you, the national jurisdiction area also forms part of this pane. If I would tick the box off, the green line would disappear. And if I tick it on, it will actually reappear. But remember the screening site um, panel is basically a, a placeholder for the sites and the footprints that you're going to add at a later stage. Next, I'm going to expand the planning cadastral uh, pane. And notice that we activated urban and farm portions to be used in the tool. In this case, um, you will notice that the tick boxes are grayed out. This means the layer or these layers are actually scale dependent. So they will not show on the scale. And this is part of the process where we also would like to make it an, an, uh, a comfortable experience for the user so that all the data sets will not be displayed on a national level. But as you zoom in, some of them will be activated as you proceed. So let's just zoom in on this map area in the middle. You will see it's still grayed out and suddenly it became dark. And you can notice here that some of the farm portions are indicated. I'm just going to switch my uh, map area back to a topographic map so that you can clearly see these farm portions um, as they are here. Notice that if I hold in the left mouse button, I can also pan uh, left to right on the system. Okay. And then at this point in time, I just want to also mention that we've got urban farm portions and demonstration. You will also know that we uh, notice that we have um, the parent farms for ease of use. I'm just going to also activate the street maps and then you can easily see to what extent the farm portions and uh, urban align on the street maps. And I'm just simply panning to the left. And I'm usually quite impressed with the type of refresh rate that you will see on the system. Let's zoom out and my oven and farm portions will be grayed out. And let's go back to topographic and I can place play with my base maps as I would like to. Then let's move to the orientation map. I'm just going to minimize the cadaster, move to the orientation map. We also added a wealth of information in terms of the administrative boundaries. I'm going to ex expand this and just take note, we've got wards, tribal authorities, towns, municipalities, etc. On this scale, again, one would not like all these boundaries to actually be switched on, but just get an, uh, a feeling that if I would switch on all the administrative boundaries, this is going to be quite a busy map. So one would typically most probably simply switch on many of these layers and maybe stay with something simple, such as, for example, just the provincial boundaries, as in this case displayed on the map pane. I'm going to switch off the admin boundaries and just quickly flag the development zones. We added a layer regarding development zones on the system. Uh, these are typically those zones that will 
also play a role once you draw a report to indicate whether there are certain exceptions or maybe um, other rules that come into play. Once I expand, you can also see the legend on the left-hand side with air quality priority areas, the two nationally gazetted Gauteng EMF zones, zone one and five, and so forth. I'm going to switch it off, minimize, minimize the folder, and then also just show you the EMF outlines. And if I tick that on, you will notice that the EMFs are also displayed environmental management frameworks. There's an option button, these three horizontal lines that's next to this layer option. Kindly note that you can tick this button, zoom to the layer, you have access to certain bit of metadata that's part of the service. You can view the legend or switch off the legend. And I am also quite fond of this transparency button. I'm just quickly going to show you that if I've got zero transparency, it will show darker. And obviously, if I take it to the left, it's almost 100% transparent at this point in time. So you won't see that layer. And you will notice right through the usage of the tool that these buttons are available to actually uh, make the data sets a bit more transparent or um, more prominent as you would like to use them. So the next step, and I, I love to actually demonstrate this as well. The moment when we selected the services hospitality um, uh, application, the system actually went through the general methodology data sets and activated two sets of data. And you will notice that these data sets are very, very similar to the ones at the bottom. So what would the difference be? Notice that at the top you've got sensitivity and at the bottom you've got original data. And these data sets has been added as a national layer for your leisure. So let's just open the agriculture theme. And while I mention agriculture theme, just to make it easier for the user, we actually combined data into themes. For example, from the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, we received the data set land capability and field crop boundaries. They do have sensitivities linked to them as provided by the custodian. And then we combine these two data sets with their sensitivities into a combined sensitivity layer. But notice at the bottom, you also have access to land capability and field crop boundaries, but the original data. So what the, would this typically look like? Let's switch on the agricultural combined sensitivity layer. Notice it's grayed out. So I'll have to zoom in a little bit and get a feeling for for the scale and notice what happens i've got the agricultural combined sensitivity and i've got three four types of uh, statuses on the system if i expand the legend you will notice i've got high sensitivity dark reddish color a high sensitivity reddish i've got medium which is most of the orange areas and then low the green areas I can also click on any of these areas. For example, I'm going to click on that green area. And uh, so in some cases, just notice that it might take a little bit longer for the identify button to display some information. And it simply depends on the amount of data that's available at that specific point in time in your um, available range of data sets. So just notice it, as I clicked on the green, it indicates it's an agricultural combined sensitivity. It's a combined sensitivity low, and it has information on land capability, and the sensitivity class is also low. I'm just going to kill that. Notice that when I expand land capability, I also have four classes, but in the case of field crop boundaries, I only have a very high and a high as received from the department. So if I would switch off the combined sensitivity and switch on the field crop boundaries, you will notice that only the field crop boundaries will display with a very high and a high sensitivity. 
Notice the darker red versus the red. But I can also move down to the original data set. Let's go to field crop boundaries. I'm going to expand this layer. And you will notice that if I scroll down, I've got a range of field crop boundary original data. Let's switch it on. And you will notice if I pan around, I've got some pivot areas here. So would I click on the circle at the middle? I, it will indicate its pivot irrigation and it tallies with my legend on the left hand side, pivot irrigation and give me additional information on this in this window. So ladies and gentlemen, just that important aspect that you can use all these data sets to complement one another and, and indicate what the importance of these data sets are while you're actually scrutinizing the data for the site or the footprint in order to come up with your final um, sites and the final report. I'm going to move forward to the add data section. Now this is quite important to understand. The data sets in the layer section are added by the system for your use and these layers will actually participate in the reporting process. So the moment that you identify a site or a footprint, these layers will be used to actually compile the final report. At the bottom, you will notice there's an eight add data panel or pane, and this is where you can add your own data. What I did just for the uh, purpose of this demonstration, I actually added I'm going to add some data from my C drive, which I uh, prepared beforehand. I've got a folder webinar today, and I've got an add data um, folder. Maybe at this point in time, it's just good to note that it's always good to have a folder structure on your C drive or your server, because you're going to create various data sets during the process of using the screening tool and just to save them in an orderly fashion. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to add data to the system from my folder system. So let's just minimize this. I've got two options. I can add a web map service or I can add a data file. I'm going to click and add data file at this point in time. And I've got the option of adding zipped shape files, CSV or comma delimited files, and then typical Google Earth KML or KMZ files. I did notice that somebody sent a, a note uh, during the registration that the person wanted to upload a zipped CSV file. You do not need to zip CSV files or KML files. You can use those files in their native format, but you need to zip shape files. And I think the GIS users will actually know what I'm referring to when I would go to any uh, data set. I'm going to go to download data set. I'm going to a folder. Notice that a typical shape file will consist of a few files making up one shape file. For example, the Biota CBA's national file does have a projection file, a date debase file, it's got a shape file, and these files combined actually make up one shape file. And it's important to understand, and I would advise you, if you want to share your shape files with other people, it's always good practice to actually uh, zip all these files together and then email the one zipped file and not the files as individual files because would you miss one then the shape file wouldn't open at the target or destination good let's choose a file i'm going back to my webinar folder i'm going to add data and i'm going to add this crawl parent webinar shape file which is currently in a zipped format I'm going to open the file. Oh, I didn't select. Open the file. It adds it to the bar and I need to add it to the map. What you will notice that it reads the file from the system and then it will proceed to zoom to that shape file on the map pane and actually show you 
the, in this case, the cadastral information, my topographical base map, as well as the shapefile that I just up uploaded. I can discard this shapefile by clicking on the X, or I can simply remove the layers. I would like to also just quickly show you what I did in the meantime. I also took this shape file and I just clipped a shape file called field crop boundaries. And I used that clip file or I converted that clip file to a KML or KMZ format. And I'm just going to overlay that with this shape file. So let's choose file. You will notice I've got a Wurgekral field crop boundary clip file that I generated. I'm going to select it, open, add to the map. And once it reads this data set, you will notice that it will superimpose that on the existing data set. I'm zooming out a little bit. Notice that I've got my clipped field crop boundaries layer. I would advise you as well, when you upload your own, own data sets, kindly uh, consider to actually upload data sets that's more or less uh, to the extent of the site or the footprint areas, because it just makes logical sense that if you upload large data sets, those data sets will, might just slow the system down. Notice that these data sets that you actually add, your own data sets, will not participate in the reporting process. So we allow you the option to add your own data sets. Let's say, for example, you've got some additional work that you did and you captured some data. You're welcome to upload those data sets, use it in the process to make certain decisions, but note that it will not participate in the final reporting process. Then I'm also going to choose a CSV file. So I add some coordinates in an Excel spreadsheet. I converted those uh, coordinates to a CSV file, a comma delimited file. I'm going to select the file. I'm going to open the file and I'm going to add it to the map. And you will notice when I did my last field visit to this site, I actually captured some points with my GPS or maybe my phone and I decided to actually display that on my map. What's quite handy about this way of going about is if I go to identify site panel, I can go and select the draw option, maybe click on polygons, and then I can start the drawing, but now my points can guide me. So I'm going to click on these points and notice how a polygon will start to form and I'll double click, double click on the last point and the system actually generates this graphic image um, which is currently in process to become my site. Notice that on my manage areas button I now have a site which was added because I used these points that I uploaded to generate a polygon. I'm just going to discard this for the moment. And then lastly, I'm just going to add, let's just zoom out, and I'm just going to add a web map service. I'm going to click on the web map service. Um, I can't recall the link of the cuff, so I'm just going to uh, quickly um, click a link that I created beforehand. I've got a word file with a few links that I gener uh, generated before, and I'm going to control C, click on the link. I'm going to click, close these applications, and then I'm simply going to paste that URL, control V, in the service URL space. I'm going to add it to the map, and you will notice it immediately adds the data at the bottom. And notice that in these cases where I added the data, it also added the data to my layer panel. So I have the option to now switch off that shapefile, the clip, clipped field crop boundaries KML, and also the CSV that I added. But I still cannot see my development zone web map service. 
just notice that you kindly can just expand it at the top, switch on the development zones, and I'm just going to expand it here, and it brought in my web map service directly from a server. I think this deserves a, a, an applause. Good. I'm going to remove all these layers that I added. Simply click on remove. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that covers the map pane, the data that's been added based on your classification and the type of activity that you selected and the fact that you can add your own data sets in this uh, data pane. I'm going to move to what I believe to be the most important pane on the system, and that's to identify the site. And because quite a few of you are not GIS users and are not so familiar with the screening tool, I just want to spend a few minutes on the options that you have in order to identify a site on the map pane. So I'm going to start from the right-hand side. I'm going to add a shape file. I have an existing shape file, and that is the site that I would like to use. So I'm going to upload this shape file. And I would quickly like to just demonstrate, I'm going to upload exactly the same file that I uploaded from the add data map pane. So let's say add data file. I'm going to choose, you will remember my Wuggekral parent webinar file, that zipped shape file. I'm going to open it it will actually add to the map once I click the add to map button and it dis displays the shape file as added. But notice if I go to the right hand side and I've got my shape file and I browse to the same file, it's also a zipped shape file and I open it in this case and I then upload the file. Notice in this case you will upload on the left hand side we add it to the map. I actually now have two um, images on top of one another. The one being my shape file that I added as a site, and the other being the shape file. This one will not participate in any reporting process, but this site map, however, will participate in the process of clipping data sets based on the extent of that uploaded shapefile. I'm just quickly going to switch off the shapefile on the left hand side and you will notice this is the uploaded shapefile and if I click on my manage areas button I now have a site area which is not the shapefile from the left however it's the shapefile that I uploaded uh, from the C drive or my server and I can again zoom to the file, edit geometry edit coordinates and delete. I'm going to delete this. Got a bit of a slow response here. And I'm going to jump to the second option. You can also add coordinates and in this way add data to the system. Notice that you can add decimal degrees as well as degrees, minutes and seconds. And you have longitude and a latitude bar you have the two projection options, WGS84 and RTBS hook 1994. I will use the add button to add my coordinates one by one. And then notice that I can add a buffer. I also could add a buffer when I added the shape file. And you will notice that this option of adding a buffer will be consistent with all these buttons. So the moment that you start identifying a site, you can simply add a buffer at your own leisure. So what I did, I actually created a uh, add coordinate Excel spreadsheet. And in this spreadsheet, I've got a few coordinates, which I uh, got hold of during my last field visit. And what I'm going to do, let me just minimize this a little bit. And I'm simply going to add these coordinates from my Excel spreadsheet into the um, identify site pane. So I'm going to click on the first um, X value, control C. I'm going to paste control V. I'm going to just get hold of my spreadsheet again. My latitude, which is negative. Uh, the non-GIS users, you will know 
uh, maybe not know, but take note thereof that your latitude will always be a negative value as we're in the southern hemisphere. Control C and latitude control V and I'm going to add that coordinate. Notice that on the map pane it will actually jump to that point and I'm ready to actually add the next point. I'm opening my Excel spreadsheet, X value, control C, control V, back to my spreadsheet. I'm going to copy the latitude and I'm, I'm doing this because this will illustrate something to the user. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to these points. It's currently two points that was added. And then I'm going to go back to my third point. And this is the reason for why I would like to demonstrate this is so that people do not get confused when they actually get error messages on the system. I'm adding my third point, latitude, and I add, you will notice that the system indicates I've got the geometry error at this point in time. The polygon ring does not close. The reason for that being, I added three points, point number one, point number two, and point number three, but the polygon is still not closed. So I need to add additional points because this is not yet a closed polygon. So how do I get there? I'm simply going to proceed and add my fourth point, control C, control V, I'm going to at the latitude, control C, control V. Please bear with me. I just want to illustrate something. I'm adding that point. It still complains that the geometry is not perfect. One, two, three, four points. I'm going to go back to my Excel spreadsheet, control C. This is my fifth point, control V. Jump to the Excel spreadsheet, control C. Control V, I'm going to add the point and I'm still not done because the first coordinate on my first line should correlate exactly with the last point to ensure that I've got a closed polygon. So I'm going to go back, back to my spreadsheet, Control C, I add the point, Control V, and where's my spreadsheet, Control C for the latitude. I add the point, I control V and I add and suddenly my image changes and I did not get the complaint from the system that I do not have a completed polygon. Notice that a site has been added at the bottom, which again I can edit geometry. Let's say I want to edit the geometry for the moment. I can actually make the whole area smaller and I can also drag some of these points. I could also go beyond that and say, okay, let's edit the coordinates and I'm going to click on the second last coordinate and I'm going to say delete row and you will notice my image changed a little bit because I got rid of a row. Let's delete another row. So this is the, these are the ways that you can actually manipulate these sites because you still have a graphic image sitting on top of all the layers as a site. I'm going to get rid of the site, minimize this one, and then get to the draw option. In the draw option, notice you again can add a buffer, you can clear the drawing, you can disable the drawing mode, but the four buttons that you would like to focus on in the draw option will be these buttons. Take note, and I'll quickly demonstrate that, for a point and a line option, you will have to create a buffer. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. But for a rectangle and a polygon, you are set to go once you added a polygon or a rectangle. Let me add a point first and just illustrate this. Click to add point, I'm clicking. But notice at the bottom, you cannot check site sensitivity. The box is grayed out because sensitivity can only be checked on polygons. So what we will have to do, we will have to add a, let's just add a five kilometer buffer. You've got the option of 
kilometers and meters, and I'm going to create a buffer. Notice what happens. The system draws a five kilometer buffer around that point and then prompts you, do you want to replace the geometry, the existing geometry? That's the point with that of the buffer geometry. And as I cannot check sensitivity on the point, I will indicate yes. People have asked me in the path, can I do un uh, click the undo button? Unfortunately, there's no undo button button available at this point in time. But ladies and gentlemen, I think it's so simple. If you made a mistake, to simply go to the manage areas button, get rid of this site and just restart the process. Good. I'm going to just delete the site that I created using the point option. Let's go to the line option. I'm going to click line. Notice that the system guides me, say click to start drawing. I'm going to click, click to continue drawing, a second click, third, and double click to com complete. But notice check sensitivity is gray out and sensitivity can only be checked on polygons. Okay, so let's keep the five kilometers, create a buffer, and the system will again prompt me do you want to replace the existing geometry that that's the geometry of the line with the buffer geometry and i'm going to say yes good and that will be a line with a um, five kilometer buffer and taking into consideration the line extent that i used etc so this is actually quite uh, uh, an extensive um buffer for a very short line good it added a site area i'm going to get rid of this the site and i'm going to go back to a rectangle first because i think this is so simple you can simply click hold in the mouse button drag to the bottom and you've got a rectangle and you can again add a buffer notice that my system immediately indicates that I can check the sensitivity because I do not have a point or a line, but I do have a polygon area or a, uh, an area which can check sensitivity. I'm just going to get rid of the rectangle as well as a site. And then the last one that I would like to show on the draw button is a polygon. I'm of the opinion that most of you are going to use the polygon option. So if you want to draw a polygon, you can have numerous clicks. So I'm going to click to start drawing, click, maybe add about five clicks, double click. It immediately creates a graphic image on the system. I can use this system to then drill through the layers to determine the sensitivity. Note that I can also create a buffer notice that it added my coordinates i can get rid of the coordinates i can go to the management areas it added the site and i can edit geometry and fiddle around with the site if there is a need to do something like that good i'm going to skip the select button for a moment because you will see how the select button comes into play the moment that you use the search button. Now the search button has been designed to actually help you search on farm names, farm portions, 21 digit codes and so forth. I'm going to quickly use a few examples so that we can actually get to my lodge, which I still have to go and determine the sensitivities of. So let's click on farm name. I've got a farm that I identified as Elon's Flay. Notice how the system guides me. It immediately picks up all the forms with an Elance in the name, but I'm going to narrow this down by adding VL. So now I've got the two spellings of Elance Flay, two different forms. I'm going to select the top one, and then you need to search for the form Elance Flay on the system. So I'm going to click search. It goes through the database, but it actually finds a whole bunch of farms with the name Elon's Flay. I'm just going to zoom out quickly to the home extent and I'm going to switch to imagery and then you can clearly see there are actually a few 
Elon's Fly farms, but if you add the farm portions, there's quite a wealth of farms in the system. I'm just going to select Elon's Fly 1116. In fact, I'm actually interested in farm portion seven. Uh, so I'm just going to double click. It will zoom automatically to that extent. I'm going to zoom a little bit out. Yeah, there's another option. If you don't want to minimize the panes on the left and right, you can actually even drag them a little bit to the side to ensure that you have got a bigger working space or map pane. So I've got all the uh, portions of the form 116 at my disposal. Notice that at this point in time, I have not yet select, selected a specific portion. I actually have all the portions selected. If I would like to select just portion seven, which is this one, how do I know? I can click on these options, do you know? notice that option zero is this portion, portion one, portion two, portion five, and you can actually see where am I on the system in terms of the guidance that I received from the right hand side. I'm interested in portion seven, and I need to go and select that portion out of the selection. Remember, I've got a whole bunch of other forms that's also selected. So I'm going to select. And apart from the clear the selected properties option and disable this selection mode, my two important buttons here will be these two. This one will be the activate select features by extent tool. This is the button that you will use to drag more than one portion. For example, if I would like to select both these portions, I will select this option. I will click on, on this portion and simply drag ab across both portions and it will select both portions. If I select the activate select features by point tool, I'm just going to select one portion using a, a point facility. Okay, let's click on a parcel. Notice what happened. It now selected this parcel, but it still selected the larger parent form. And you will see that on the right hand side, portion seven, as well as the parent form. I'm not really interested in the parent form, so I'm simply going to clear the parent form on this side. And I'm going to just zoom in a little bit. And that's the portion that I'm interested in. At this point in time, I can still add a buffer. I can clear the results. I can create the site area because this is still just a selected portion from the form portion layer. And I can delete the site area and then I'll be back to square one. I'm just quickly going to click on this um, portion and then you will notice that the window that pops up shows me it's form 116 and it's portion 000, which is most probably the parent form. And if I click on this next feature, and sometimes people tend to forget that there are um, more than one pane to actually toggle to. So I'm just going to click here and you will notice that this portion itself is form 116 and portion 0007. And it's in the uh, uh, region Calvinia and the form name, and I've got an SG code. I'm just going to just while I'm here, just copy this SG code so that I can remember it. I'm going to close this pane and I'm going to uh, delete the site area. Good. Let's go back to search and use the farm number and portion option. Notice that I know already that this is farm number 1116 and the portion was seven. And I can search, remember the search option after you typed search. And if I zoom to the full extent, um, there may be more than one farm portions that were selected. No, you, it's, although it's faint, you may see it on your screen. And it 
um, indicates in the result box that I've got Elon's Fly 1116 portion 7, but it also picked up a form with a number 1116 and a portion 7 in Rustenburg and also in Sheila in the vicinity of Tsanin. So I'm interested in this form. I'm going to click, double click the form portion. It zooms to that same extent and I'm happy that I'm on the portion where I would like to be. Good. I'm going to just zoom to the full extent. You remember, remember I copied the SG code just now. I'm just going to click on SG code, click on the bar, control V to paste. It inserts the um, 21 digit code. I'm going to search. It should only find one result because the SG code is in a unique value. I'm going to double click this option and I'm again on portion seven. So this covered the form name option, the form number and portion, as well as the 21 digit code. The next option that I quickly want to show is this, that you can use the place name or address option. And this will use the world decoder to search for an existing place. So I know of a street address 125 Alma Rula Street, Notice that the system finds three Amarulas, Amarula in Waterberg, Amarula Gardens, and Amarula Street. I know this, the one in Nansfield, Vemby, is the one that I'm interested in. I'm going to double click. I'm going to search for it. And I'm, it, it finds the result, and I'm just going to double click and notice that it zooms to the relevant spot. You will know that Irvin has, automat uh, has automatically switched on on the left hand side. I'm just going to change the base map back to a topographic map so that you can easily see all the Irvin indicated on the map pane. And then what will it be easy once you've got your address to identify certain areas on the map. For example, I can click on the system and I will pick up that this is earth number 4002 and it's part of Messina Nansfield. Let's quickly do a test. If I would minimize this, remember 4002 and it's Messina, I'm just going to use the option earth number and area name. Let's zoom out to the full extent. Earth number and area name, I type 4002 and I've got the area Messina. You may remember that we picked up the Messina and I've got two options. It's in Malmesbury or Messina Nansfield. I'm going to select Messina Nansfield. I'm going to search for that specific portion, double click on the portion and it will automatically zoom to that extent. And I'm going to just zoom out to get a better perspective. And I'm still in Amaruna Street. Well, I think that's quite a mouthful and I shared a lot of information on the map pane and you can see that you never really want to move away from your map pane at this, as this is the visual part of the exercise. On the left hand, your layer data sets. Um, I'm just going to delete this Hoogekral parent form which I added at some stage. Um, you've got your add data which is your personal data that you can add, it will not participate in the reporting process, and then identifying the site. So I'm just going to go through this exercise where I actually have a form, and I would like to add a footprint to the form to determine my uh, sensitivities. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to the form, Driefontein, and for those of you who are um, foreign visitors to this webinar, the, the Afrikaans name Driefontein will mean three fountains if you would directly translate it. So let's look for the form Driefontein or three fountains. I'm going to double click. I'm going to search for the form and I will get quite a few results on the right hand pane. Um, one can actually use this option to simply then peruse through these um, options that you have on the right right hand side, especially in the absence 
of more detail and you're not exactly sure where you would like to be. But I found from Griefontein, and I know my farm number is 290, so I'm going to select this, and then the system will indicate that it found, let me just zoom out, it found, found all the farm portions that I'm interested in. My exact scenario in this situation is that there's a river, I'm the owner of this farm. I am exactly or specifically interested in these two farm portions because my dream was also because I've got a road on the system here indicated as a gray line. I thought it might be a good idea to build a lodge just next to the river here. But let's have a look at the sensitivities in order to determine, first of all, what does this site look like and what are the sensitivities on the site? And then secondly, to place my footprint. So I'm going to jump back to my select button. I'm going to use this button, which is the extend tool button. And I'm going to select both those two farm portions because they're adjacent to the river. But notice what happened. I've got three portions that were selected. Let's click on them. Portion one, okay, I'm happy with that. Portion two, which is then portions one and three. But if I click on this one, I see I've got a larger portion, which is most probably part of the parent farm or the parent farm. And I'm not interested in the parent farm, so I'm just simply going to clear that. Now I've got the two portions selected that I'm interested in, and I can proceed to create a site. This is the button that we haven't really touched on to date because I indicated how one can add coordinates, shape files, draw an area, etc. And it created the site. But in this case, because I searched for two farm portions from the cadastral farm portion layer, I still need to create a site. I'm going to click on create site and you will see the typical yellow graphic image that sits on the screen. It added a site area and again I can fill with the site area if I feel the need. I'm not going to fill with this site at this point in time. I would like however like to just demonstrate something uh, especially for the South African users. You may be aware that for example in the case of protected areas there are a five kilometer buffer around those areas. And in the case of national parks, there are a 10 kilometer buffer area around those parks that you need to consider when you do certain planning. So you can also use the, the, the tool in an opposite way. For example, I've got a site area. I'm going to give the site area a five kilometer buffer and I'm going to create the buffer. The system prompts me, do you want to uh, replace the geometry of that's that that initial uh, graphic image with the buffered image i'm going to say yes because i just quickly want to use this as an option to actually look at certain data sets that might be available available in the system and because i mentioned protected areas i'm just quickly on the left hand side going to expand um, the original data set the base map indicated that there's a mountain zebra national park just adjacent to the new five kilometer buffer that I actually created to my two polygons. And notice that if I would actually then switch on the terrestrial biodiversity and the protected areas, I will pick up that there are protected areas close to the area that I selected because I gave it this five kilometer buffer. In fact, if I added a 10 kilometer buffer to include the national parks and the World Heritage Sites, it would have covered this national park. And uh, let's just expand the legend. And it seems to me that this area at the bottom is either a nature reserve or a protected area. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not so clear on the color. Let's just click there and it will indicate it's part of the mountain zebra come protected environment. 
So I know now by using my original data sets that I'm very close to two protected areas at this point in time. Good. I just wanted to illust illustrate that so that you can see how easy it is to use these layers and to actually determine uh, the sensitivity or the proximity to sensitive areas. I'm just going to delete the site simply because um, I created a footprint that's a little bit larger than the one that I'm actually looking for. So I'm just going to go back to search and I'm going to use the option farm name Driefontein again. I'm going to search for the farm Driefontein. I should have copied the, um, the 21 digit code just now. That would have been easier. But let's go to the select button. I'm going to use the select um, uh, extend tool button. I'm going to select those two portions. Notice that it displays three areas. I remember that the bottom one was the parent farm. I'm going to get rid of the parent farm and I'm going to create a site. And I've got my site on the screen. The next step is so important because this is the step where you would like to check the sensitivities of this um, site that you created. So notice that I can still delete the site, but I would like to proceed to the check site sensitivity step. So let's click the site sensitivity. Notice that this pane now actually changes quite a bit. At the top, it added the download all layers uh, tab. It also added a download site tab. You will notice that I've got a select a sensitivity theme to view on the map. And remember in the beginning, I mentioned that we uh, combined data sets in themes to assist the user. Currently, there's nothing displayed because we would like you to actually activate the theme that you're interested in or all the layers um, as you proceed. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. Notice that there are no assessment protocols active at this point in time because I haven't checked the, sens uh, checked the sensitivity yet. And an important note at the bottom, I can proceed to place a footprint, but I haven't yet uh, scrutinized the sensitivity. And I can also generate a site report at this point in time. And this is a critical step in the whole phase. As you will remember, we've got these breadcrumbs. It is possible that a user or an applicant might want to go through the steps of tick the disclaimer, select the category, identify the site, check the site sensitivity, and maybe decide, you know what, at this point in time, I would maybe like to engage with an EAP um, and or maybe a competent authority or a specialist in the field to actually give me some advice before I add a footprint. So it's totally possible at this point in time to check all the sensitivities and stop the process there. And that's why it's so important that you can actually download all the layers and download the site um, at this point in time. Because ladies and gentlemen, it will just be so much easier when you revisit the system and you can simply upload the site that you already downloaded and you don't have to go through this whole process of selecting, searching, combining um, farm portions, etc. Good. So at this point in time, you notice that I did check the site sensitivity. It didn't display anything because as a default, the system is on none. And now I'm going to click all sensitivities. Now, while this system is running, what the system is doing, it's actually using the outline of this graphic image to drill through all the data sets. In the beginning, I showed you that you could use the sensitivity layers and the original layers for the whole of South Africa. But what will happen now is it will actually pick up the sensitivities or those sensitivities just for this specific footprint. And then it will indicate this very high, high, medium and low sensitivities as part of a legend. And this becomes such an important part of the process because I picked up that according to my system, the agriculture combined sensitivity 
has a very high, high, medium and low sensitivity for this site. If I scroll down, I will notice aquatic biodiversity combined. There's a very high and a low. Archaeological and cultural heritage, I've got a high sensitivity. Civil aviation, high and medium. So I've got quite a few high sensitivities that's coming into play regarding this site. And my only aim is to actually determine where can I exactly put my footprint without infringing with these high sensitivity areas. And that is the strength of this tool and why you would actually like to use the tool in order to prepare your report. So I'm going to click on this drop down button next to the all sensitivities. I've looked at the options at the bottom, which guides me, and I'm going to click on the agricultural theme. And you will notice that on the left hand side, I can still see my two farm portions and my graphic image sitting on top of all my layers, but I can now get a feeling for the agriculture combined sensitivity. I will notice some pivot irrigation. I will notice some um, high sensitivities, the green low sensitivity and the orange medium sensitivity. And this will guide me because you will remember in the beginning, I mentioned that I would like to place my lodge close to the river, but there's some agricultural sensitivities here. And maybe I would like to refrain from placing my footprint or my lodge in this vicinity. You could also use this next theme button to simply toggle through the different themes. So I'm going to click. Okay, just a little bit slow. Um, the aquatic biodiversity, I think the very high here is simply because I've got a river here and there might be some sensitivities in terms of an aquatic perspective. Let's click on the next button. This is the archaeological sensitivity. And now I'm doing a visual assessment and picking up that there's quite a few sensitivities currently next to the river, which I have to take into account. I'm going to jump to civil aviation. Wow, I've got a huge red area here. And some of you may have noticed that I'm in the vicinity of Craddock. Here's the Craddock Golf Club. So I'm going to assume that maybe it's the extent of a, an airport in the area and that there's a certain sensitivity um, um, located in this area that's related to that airport. Let's jump to the next theme. Paleontology. Oh, I also have everything covered in red. And remember that you can at any stage click on the system and it will actually identify what is happening at that specific point in time. And notice again, I know that the paleontology combined sensitivity is quite an extensive layer and we have quite a few other layers that's also sitting on this map pane at this point in time and if i would click at any space it will come up with the data but it needs to go through all these data sets in order to provide that information notice that i've got a farm pane i've got the parent farm and i also have paleontology combined sensitivity and it indicates that I've got a high sensitivity for rock units with a high paleontological sensitivity. Good. With that knowledge, I'm going to proceed. I've got a defense theme there. My sensitivity is low. I've got terrestrial biodiversity and I notice there's some impact here as well in terms of terrestrial sensitivity. Let me quickly just see what could that be. Um, I'm going to switch on on my original data set, just the CBAs, and I'm going to switch off the sensitivity layer. And you will notice that if I switch on the CBAs, I think it's just a little bit slow at this point in time. Let me just move it to refresh a little bit. Um, at this point in time, you, you might have noticed at the left hand side, you've got these um, uh, buttons that circle. So sometimes when they circle, they give you an indication that the layer is simply refreshing at that point in time. Do you notice that this pattern here is exactly the same as the sensitivity pattern that I picked up uh, from the 
sensitivity layers. And I will then know that it's the CBA that actually shows. You know, do you see that correlation? Good. With that information, I know that I've got a critical critical critically biodiversity area on my farm. Good. Let's minimize these pains. And I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to proceed to place my uh, footprint not next to the river, not in this area with a high CBA value, but maybe a little bit away from the river in this area. Now, before I do that, just take note as well. I mentioned that you can download your theme layers. If you have the option, download theme layers, and I'm on the terrestrial biodiversity theme, the system will download all the layers related to the terrestrial biodiversity theme as a zip file to your system. And you can save it wherever you would like to. I'm not going to do that because it could take quite a few minutes depending on your connectivity. And also note that on the right hand side, you can download your site area. I would highly advise you at this point in time, as you checked all the sensitivity sensitivities to actually download the site sensitivity and download your theme layers or all the layers that's that's applicable so if i click here let me just show you all sensitivities and you will notice that the bot button in the top middle changed to download all layers and not only the theme layers so if you indicate that you want to download all the layers it will clip all the data sets that intersects with this this graphic and you can download that to your c drive or the server just want to quickly show you that if you click on the agricultural theme you will notice that a show assessment protocol also uh, became active if i click on show assessment protocol i can actually open a pdf document that will indicate the minimum expectations or the minimum criteria for the assessment um, regarding the agricultural theme. And if you actually scroll down, you will notice that this assessment report, and I'm not going to focus on the text and the detail as some of these re, um, assessment protocols are still in a draft format and currently being developed. But notice in the document, you've got a dark red and a, a lighter red, as well as your orange and green reference with text related to that specific color. And I think you will immediately deduct that that is related to the colors of the agricultural theme. So red reflects to red. And when you activate the show assessment protocol, you can actually peruse the protocol and see what are those minimum required requirements that you need to take note of before you actually proceed with the whole process or simply download that protocol and take that further for a discussion process. And notice that you can also now generate the site report. So ladies and gentlemen, you can literally stop the process here on a site level. You've got a site assessment protocol. You've got a generate site report. You downloaded the site, you downloaded the theme layers, you verified all the sensitivities and you would like to halt the process today. I'm not going to do that. I'm just quickly going to uh, place a footprint and the whole demonstration will go much faster from here on because the whole process of adding a footprint is exactly the same as adding a or determining the site. You notice that the top bar moved to place footprint. You again have coordinates, add shape file, um, draw, select, and so on. So what I'm simply going to do in this instance, I'm going to click on the draw button I'm going to click a polygon because in my heart, I'm totally convinced that I'm going to build my lodge next to the fence because I believe this is close to the river and it's not too far from the road. I assess the sensitivities from an agricultural perspective. 
I'm in a green and an orange, and I'm very happy at this point in time. So I added my footprint. Notice in my manage areas, it added a footprint. If you would at this point in time add a second or a third footprint or alternative sites, you're welcome to do so because you'll only add one site and multiple footprints can be added. Notice that you can again, um, you can also on the footprint edit the geometry, edit coordinates and so forth and even delete the footprint if you feel you made a mistake at this point in time. I'm going to check the footprint sensitivity. And again, you can download layers at the top. Uh, you can also download the footprint. I'm not going to do that at this point in time. I'm just going to illustrate what the result will look like. And maybe I should do that as I'm mentioning that. If I download, I created a download data folder. And if I downloaded the Driefontein 290 site, you will notice that it's a zip file. And ladies and gentlemen, once you right click on this option, I think one of the easy options to unzip a zipped file is to simply right click and use this Windows option, extract files, extract files here. I use the option extract files here. I'm going to click on this one just to show you that once you say extract files here, the system will create a folder with the name zip folder. I want to caution you here because if I would actually unzip another uh, zipped um, file, it will also create a zip folder. So I think it's crucial that you immediately name that folder. So just click on it and give it a name. I'm just quickly going to type Dion, enter. And now I know this is the Dion zip file that has been expanded. If I double click on this folder, you will notice there's a shape, shape file information in this folder. Let's quickly just go back. Um, I should have just wanted to show you uh, downloaded data. If I would take something such as I downloaded for Driefontein at some stage, I downloaded the agricultural theme data. Let's do the same. I'm going to right click, extract here. Notice it creates the zip folder. I'm going to just click on it and say Driefontein and agric because it's just the agricultural data. And when I open that, you will notice that in this case, I've got the agricultural shape files for that specific site that I identified. Good. With that understanding, let's go back to the check footprint sites, uh, check footprint sensitivity. Um, I've got all my sensitivities. And ladies and gentlemen, you will notice now that when I display all the sensitivities, that there's a marked difference in what happened in this panel. I still have civil and paleontology as a very high because you, you will remember just now when I switched them off, they covered basically the whole site area. But I, I've got a concern here that I have agricultural combined sensitivity still with a high, medium and low. So what I'm going to do, I'm just quickly going to display my agricultural theme and I'm going to pan to the bottom, zoom in, and I see, ah, uh, I realize what my problem is. I'm still falling in a portion which is a high agricultural sensitivity. I'm going to click on my manage your areas button. I'm going to my footprint. I'm going to edit geometry. And I'm going to simply take this button and move it to a spot where I know this footprint doesn't touch on that uh, highly sensitive area for agriculture. What you could have done as well, you could have actually just moved the whole site if that was something that you felt you deem relevant and possible. And what I will do now, I still have high, medium and low, but I'm just going to refresh this agricultural theme. And you will notice it changed to just 
medium and low. And I'm comfortable that I will be able to motivate my largest existen existence on this medium sensitivity agricultural. And then I'm, I'm finished and I feel it's time to stop to generate a full report. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to, uh, well, maybe I should just quickly show you a second fruit footprint. I think we have some time. We do have some time. Um, I'm just going to zoom out and just quickly show you that what one can do here is one can actually go and add a line or a road, maybe from the existing road to um, link with my existing footprint. It will add a second um, footprint and I can include that in my report. What I'm going to do now, just for the sake of time, I'm going to click on generate full report as my last step as part of my breadcrumbs. And I'm going to click generate full report. Notice that I've got a few options in terms of adding logos and so forth. I'm just going to add from my existing folder structure a logo. I added a logo for the Department of Environmental Affairs. It places the logo in the bar. I'm going to add the National Development Program uh, Plan logo. I'm going to add the 20 Years of Freedom logo. And then I can also beautify the front page of my report a little bit. And I'm going to browse and add a lodge scene of my lodge that I intend to build and the vicinity thereof. Um, now I'm ready to download my full report. I can click on download and the following report fields are necessary to complete my report. This is the step where the integration between the integrated permitting system and the screening tool will come into play where the application applicant will actually in future receive an application number from the integrated permitting system which could be added into the report at this point in time. So I'm just going to um, thumb suck any number here, one, two, three, ABC, the project name, Drifontaine um, 290 Lodge. I'm going to add a project title, title which could be maybe the same, control C, control V, maybe I'm just going to add a date in this case, and the applicant is Dion, and the compiler is a guy, DWM, and I'm going to click on OK. Now, in my experience to date is that this process will usually take about two to three minutes, and sometimes people may complain a little bit and say, well, is that not too long for the report to generate? Um, I say no, because if you think in terms of the amount of data sets that the report takes into consideration to actually compile this report, it's actually quite nifty. But while this is happening, I'm just quickly going to jump into another tab where I've got the screening tool open. And while that report is running, I'm just going to quickly just recap. I'm going to open a screening tool. I'm going to agree to the terms and conditions. I'm going to click on next. I'm going to click a classification. In this case, I'm just going to use a, on a certain form, I want to clear a piece of land. So I'm going to click agriculture, forestry and fisheries. Um, actually, it's a transformation of land. I made a mistake there. And it's from agriculture or forestry. And it will also use the general related methodology. I'm going to click on next. You remember the three panes. Notice that it changed from transformation of land um, activity from ag agriculture and uh, afforestation application. I've got my breadcrumbs. I've got a different naming for my data sets. I can add data, etc. But what I would like to do in this case, I just quickly want to select a farm again. And I just want to show you how easy it is to actually get to the point of adding a site and adding a footprint. 
So let's just quickly use select the form. I've got a form that I'm aware of, which is called Ian Zalm Pate. You will notice it immediately assists me with a name. I'm going to click on Ian Zalm I'm going to search for Ian Zalm I get some results and um, I'm interested in Ian Zalm 113 in the vicinity of George. Just look at the system and you will see there's quite a few forms with the name Ian Zalmate, which in which is actually a Dutch name for the people that's not Afrikaans or English speaking. Ian Zalmate means loneliness. So I guess these guys may have felt very lonely at some stage. Double click on Ian Zalmate and I notice I've got quite a few portions. These three portions are the portions that belong to me. So I'm going to select those three portions with not the point tool, but the extent tool. I'm going to select those three portions. I'm going to just verify what is what. I'm going to get rid of the parent form. I'm going to create a site and I've got my image that's available. Just at this point in time, remember that only when you download the site, this image becomes a shapefile. At this point in time, this image is literally just a blob or a graphic that sits on top of all the data sets. I can, okay, I'm being interrupted here. The, uh, in the meantime, the other screening tool that I had open indicates that a report has been generated. I'm just going to click on my folder reports and I'm going to save that report as Prefontaine. I'm just going to call this one Dion. Then we can differentiate with the other ones. I'm going to save. It downloaded the PDF, so my report is done and it's saved. Um, I just want to show you that the button or the prompt that came onto the other screening tool that I have live um, indicated report generation completed, successfully generated the report, and one can click on OK. Let's just jump back to my quick exercise. I identified the site, I check the sensitivity, I check all sensitivities for that specific area. The system finds all the layers that intersect with my graphic image. I can see this agricultural combined sensitivity, etc. Again, I can visit all those individual data sets and I can see from an agricultural perspective, low, medium and a few eyes next to the road here. Um, I want to transform some land and that's the nature of this activity next to the road. Um, and, and that's the reason for this exercise. Just want to quickly jump to terrestrial biodiversity. You'll notice that when I look at terrestrial, the whole top area is red. Why would that be? Simply because um, if I look at terrestrial biodiversity and I switch on the conservation areas, I've got a biosphere reserve that sits north of the road. So maybe, maybe I will have to um, just make sure that I can explain exactly why I would like to do this. Just before I generate, a, uh, let's place, place a site, uh, a footprint in this case, I'm going to use the draw option, click on polygon, and I decided, decided that I just simply want to do a clearing next to the road. And I double click. I've got a site and I added a footprint and I can Check my footprint sensitivity. Check all sensitivities. I can at my own leisure look at all these individual sensitivities. I'm not going to do that now and I can generate a full report. There was one button that I didn't focus on previously and I just quickly want to show and that's the print button. At any stage, you can actually create a map of this middle section. I'm just going to click on print. You will notice I can do a print map. I'm just going to call this Ian Zom 8. It's an A4 landscape map. It's currently a PDF. 
I've got certain settings such as preserve the map scale or the map extent. I can set the scale bar units. I can include a legend or tick the legend option off. I can set the quality on 150 dots per inch or maybe more. And once I'm happy, I can simply print the map. You will notice in this case, because it's a PDF format, it will create a PDF map. And just while this is running, just take note that um, if I would go to help, because I don't understand about PDFs, PNGs, and all these things, you can go to the help file, simply search for print, and it will take you to the print map pane, and there's a lot of information with hyperlinks to what's an EPS, what's a GIF, what's a JPEG, what does this print map environment entail, and also some information, as I mentioned earlier, that whether you use Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and so on, just be aware that they handle these files or these created image a little bit differently. Good. Um, I'm just going to close the help. And in the meantime, it created my map. This was now a, a rough map that I just created just to show the uh, functionality of this tool. If I click on the PDF, I've got a map with the name at the top, um, logos that's been added, and there's a legend at the top, there's a scale bar, and I can now simply proceed to actually download or print this map and take that to anybody that's an interested and affected party and share the map with them. Good. I'm going to just go back to the screening tool and just show that we've created our report. And in essence, we are now done with our exercise. And I'm just going to quickly go to my Windows Explorer environment, see GIS webinar, and I'm going to click on my reports folder. And you'll notice that I created this Driefontein Dion report. And uh, I'm almost done. I just quickly want to peruse the report. It added a title. You will remember I gave it a reference number and I gave it a, a project name and title. And um, there's a compiler signature. You will remember the images and the logos that I added. It created a a page of a table of contents. They are all related to the content. So if I would like to jump to the agriculture map theme sensitivity map, I can simply click there. It jumps in, in the tool to the bottom. I'm going to press control home, move to the top. I'm going to scroll down and notice that I've got a general orientation map. You will immediately um, recognize the site that I created as well as the development footprint. Notice that the system added the Driefontein cadastral data in table format, as well as the footprint details in the format of coordinates. Uh, we do have an arrangement that the coordinates should be in degrees, degrees minutes and seconds, so this will change in some of our future um, products. And just notice that there are no wind and solar developments in the vicinity. There are also no EMFs found in the vicinity of my site and my footprint. And um, also my uh, relevant development incentives, restrictions and exclusions that I mentioned in the beginning. Let's just see if there's anything that it... Um, overlays with. It seems to me there are no air quality priority areas or EMF zones or renewable energy areas in the near vicinity of my site. And then I get to my development area footprint sensitivity and the tables will indicate for these different themes the highest sensitivity for each of these themes. For example, for the agricultural theme, the medium sensitivity was the highest. For aquatic, it was low. For civil aviation, it was a high sensitivity. And I need to take uh, cognizance of that in my report. 
Notice that my PDF also lists these specialist um, assessments identified, and I've got a live URL to those PDFs. I'm clicking to, on that PDF, and it immediately opens the agricultural sensitivity protocol, as I referred to just now. And I can close this protocol and maybe for landscape, in the absence of a landscape visual impact assessment, I've got access to the Appendix 6 of the EIA regulations, just to indicate to you how easy it is to actually link these PDF documents to the assessments. And then last but not least, um, I've got a list of maps in the end for my agricultural theme sensitivity. I've got a map that was automatically generated by the system. The table indicates I had a medium sensitivity for agricultural as my highest sensitivity, and that the sensitivity features were land capability and what the description thereof is. I've got a, an aquatic biodiversity theme sensitivity. It was low. It still indicates where my footprint and my site is located, and it's got a low sensitivity. And you will notice, notice the, the one on the avian sensitivity, the, the civil aviation um, sensitivity. In this case, it, in, it, uh, it identifies the site and the footprint being part of a high sensitivity, and it indicates it's within eight kilometers of other civil aviation aerodrome or aerodromes. And this is the way that the whole screening um, report then um, is generated. It's date stamped and therefore also important, and I can't stress a lot or more, that you need to download your site as well as your footprint in order to easily generate a report later on because data will change, data will be updated, and you may feel the need to actually generate a new report, especially if you only decide to apply uh, formally on the integrated permitting system process about six months later because data may have changed, sensitivities may have changed, and if you downloaded your site and your footprint, it would be so much easier to simply compile the report. I think with that, uh, I hope that you, and I believe that you have a much better understanding of the screening tool, that you will feel comfortable with the map pane, the layer data sets, that you can add your own data, how to add a site, how to check the sensitivity of the site, how to add a footprint, check the footprints uh, that you added, and then generate a report and use that report not only as part of the application process, but to share with competent authorities or specialists in order to make sure that whatever development is planned is planned in such a way that it's to the benefit of the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you um, for the opportunity. I'm just going to move back to the um, PowerPoint presentation and over to Bridget. Fantastic. Thank you, Dion. That was a great presentation and we are getting feedback already about how it's brilliant. It's well done. Amazing tool. So I won't read all of them in detail, but I, we do want to take some time to do some question and answer. We realize that we started about 15 minutes late and are certainly sensitive to your time. We will plan to extend the Q&A and extend the whole webinar 15 minutes so that we will get the full 30 minute Q&A. Um, However, we understand if you need to drop off, but please be assured we will have the recording available and you will get a link to that. So if you have to drop off, you can still pick up those last 15 minutes of questions. So we now have a full suite of people from the DEA here to help us answer the questions you've been sending in. Um, let me introduce um, the three additional people. You know Dion already. Um, we have Dee Fisher, who is the Chief Director for Integrated Environmental Management Support at DEA. And she is responsible for streamlining the environmental regulatory framework. 
Marlene Moodley is the director for GIS at DEA and is also a GIS practitioner by profession. She oversees all GIS functions at the DEA. And last but not least, Zakaria Umar works for the DEA as a chief GIS professional, managing the data operations unit in the enterprise geospatial section. He's been involved in the development of the screening tool as well. So um, let's get us started. Um, they will be um, taking turns um, answering those questions based on who's most appropriate. We do have a few questions related to the frequency of data being updated. Um, for instance, Benedict's asking about if the environmental sensitivity database is up to date, and Roberto is wondering about um, the cadastral data, if that's updated regularly. Hi, Bridget. Um... I think I'm going to take a lead on this question. Um, with regards to the update, I'm going to start with Roberto first. His question was on the updates of the cadastral data. Uh, what we do is we receive the data from the Chief Surveyor General and we get a release on a quarterly basis. Obviously, once we have the new release, um, we will intend to update the screening tool with the latest cadastral data set. Um, uh, Project, the first question was with regards to the updating of data sets, if I'm not mistaken, environmental data. Yes, sensitivity, um, environmental sensitivity database. So basically what happens is as we receive the data sets from the custodians, uh, we would have to reprocess that data and put it on, onto the screening tool. At the moment, uh, the screening tool was just developed. It's in a, on a voluntary basis. But obviously, at DIA, we would decide on, on, on quarterly releases or when, uh, once we have new data sets, uh, we would process them and, and put them on, onto the system. Obviously, uh, once we receive those data sets from the data custodians. Okay. We have a few questions regarding classifications and um, multiple classifications. For instance, um, Melissa was asking about um, a solar project that's both generation and distribution. And Alani asked about one that might be dangerous goods and infrastructure. And so do you need to do a separate screening assessment per category or is there a way to select multiple um, sector classifications? Um, thank you, Bridget. Um, in terms of generation and distribution, um, you would just select uh, the development that is most appropriate. So it would be um, a solar generation because the distribution would be included in that. So unless you were doing two separate projects, you would use just the one um, screening. Um, that was for the solar. And then the other one that you mentioned was um, um, dangerous goods and infrastructure. Infrastructure. So uh, you would just, um, dangerous good would be a tank or a filling station uh, uh, activity, and you would then be able to do those just with one, uh, one screening. Um, the, where you would need to do more than one screening is if you were doing a wind and a solar on one facility because they're quite different, their impacts are quite different, and you would need to screen uh, twice uh, for that. That's the only time that we've, through all the, all the activities that we've looked at, that was really the only time we found where you would need to do two screenings on one site. Uh, there might be others that will come up uh, through the use, but at the moment, the, the, the wind and solar were the only ones that wouldn't find uh, just the one screening acceptable. And I would just like to add, Bridget, then um, there will be two reports, and then those two reports with their different sensitivity assessments will be available. We, we had the question in the past, can we combine the two reports into one? At the moment, not. So you will have two separate reports. Okay. Um, we have a question about whether the uh, if the requirement to use the tool will change in the future based on the requirement by the department that all practitioners must be EAPSA registered by 2020. Uh, no, this, that wouldn't have an impact on the screening tool. It would just be uh, for the competent authority to accept or not the application from either a registered or non-registered uh, environmental practitioner. So for a, from a screening perspective, it wouldn't make any difference, uh, but probably from um, uh, the competent authority accepting your application, 
uh, after a certain point, you would have to be a registered uh, environmental practitioner. And if I could just add to that, uh, the screening tool at the moment is on a voluntary basis. And at uh, some point, uh, as the users become more fair with the system, we will be moving the system from a voluntary basis to a mandatory uh, basis where the, all reports then must uh, be generated from the screen tool and must be added to an application process. Uh, does the mapping include wetlands? Are these covered under the aquatic biodiversity theme? Yes, um, it does. Yes, we received the data, the aquatic biodiversity from the South African National Biodiversity, that's Sanbi, and uh, they're the custodians of those data sets, and, and aquatic, bio, the aquatic biodiversity should include wetland data. Um, ben is asking, how do we get access to SITAs or other state data as an individual or company? Sorry, uh, Bridget, you said how do you get access to state data? Um, I guess not being from South Africa, I'm not familiar with the acronym, but it's SITA. Okay, so, so I, I think it's probably spatial information uh, that he's, uh, he's referring to. So with regards to that, how, how it normally works is in South Africa, um, uh, each department, uh, whatever their mandate is, they are required to produce those data sets. And he would contact the relevant department, for example, for your cadastral data set, you would go by National Geospatial Information. They would provide you with that data. Uh, for uh, biodiversity data, you would go to uh, Sanbi and get that data from them. For agriculture related data, you would go to DAF, which is the Department of Agriculture and Forestry and Fisheries. So it all depends on the data set that you're looking for and the organization that you get it from. And if I could add to that, uh, while you're in the screening process and uh, you, are, uh, you have selected a certain area or site, the screen tool does do a clip and a zip uh, for you and it chips you the data that has been used in the screen. So when Zach referred to uh, data sets from these data custodians, if you're looking for a, a bigger data set uh, that shows uh, a larger area, then you will contact these data custodians. Whereas if you are in the screening tool, the screen tool facilitates to give you data for that, uh, for your site area. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the screening tool replace BGIS? Uh, it does not replace uh, the BGIS system. However, it uh, does provide more data to the BGIS system. At the moment, the BGIS system only deals with biodiversity data, whereas from the uh, screening tool perspective, we're dealing with uh, a range of the themes or a more holistic view of uh, uh, the data sets for that actual site. Is the screening tool applicable only for projects under the administration of the DEA or including other regional or provincial competent authorities? Um, it would be applicable to all competent authorities. Um, so anybody who's uh, wanting to submit an application for environmental authorization, if they're submitting to any one of the competent authorities, they would have to submit the report generated by the National Screening Tool. Will the screening tool include the Gauteng Conservation Plan version 3.3? I think it's included in the Sanbi data set. So obviously in the terrestrial biodiversity, what Sanbi did is they uh, looked at all the data sets and uh, uh, took in the most relevant data sets that they found. And I think the conservation data is included in the, in the Sanbi terrestrial data set. Uh, to add to that, Sanbi is uh, the national coordinator for uh, biodiversity data, and we are in agreement with them that they will use the provincial data set to include into this national data set that they are providing to us. Justin is asking if the screening tool reflects, can it reflect other applications in process and approved to reflect potential cumulative impacts as in the REDS data layer? Okay, so um, once the system is integrated in the coordinated and integrated permitting system, it will definitely be able to do that. At the moment, it just shows you the wind and solar activities uh, on a cumulative basis because we have 
we have collected that data from the time that wind and solar uh, uh, facilities were uh, applied for. It's just been through the um, through the um, the independent power producers uh, program. So it hasn't been very many years. I think it's been about uh, three or four years now. So we've collected all the wind and solar data, but all other data it will only become uh, we'll only be able to see it once we've integrated in the, uh, we, uh, into the KIP system. And we won't go backwards in time. So we won't uh, mine old information. It will just be new information going forward. Is there a consolidated Schedule 3 layer? Uh, schedule 3, I think they're talking about the listed activities, uh, Schedule 3. Um, that's just activities. So the, the the screening tool doesn't deal with activities, so um, it deals with sensitivities. Um, so no, I think the answer to that is it doesn't deal with activities, it deals with sensitivities, so there isn't a consolidated um, a listing notice three um, layer. Sheila is asking, uh, does the CBA layer take into account the individual provincial CBA layout, such as the Gauteng C plan? Basically, what happens is when Sanbi created that CBA layer, they used uh, data sets from all provincial uh, departments and uh, they merged them to create a national CBA layer. So most likely that data is, has been included. Uh, does the GIS tool have a servitude layer? That is ESCOM, Petronet, Pipeline, Municipal. And if not, will this be considered? I think under the administrative, we have some layers, but we have a general um, um, general orientation layers, and you can find um, those type of layers in there. Um, I, th I think what we would also need to do, Bridget, is just to um, request uh, people using the system to identify which ones they want. So, for example, I don't think at the moment we've got the pipelines included. So, if there's need for those things, then uh, or those that data we then should just get that as a comment and we can of course then include it. But uh, the, the facilities there, it just means that we need to go and source that data and apply the data as a, an orientation there, as part of the orientation there. Uh, were required buffers added for all layers before the classification of sensitivities? Um, so, for example, we have uh, for river uh, data set, we have added the required bu uh, buffer of 32 meters. However, the river data set, um, as many users would no uh, notice, is a river data set that is the center line of a river. Uh, and the regulation indicates that you need to be 32 meters from the edge of a river. So we, uh, we have added the 32 meter buffer to the river data set. However, an EAP, uh, or an applicant still needs to apply the 32 meters from the edge of uh, the river. We've also added the 500 meters to uh, a wetland data set, uh, but all um, uh, these data sets need to be uh, verified on site uh, in terms of where the edge of uh, the, uh, these uh, rivers uh, actually start. Just to add to that, Bridget, most listing notice buffers have been added to the data and they have been added to the combined sensor sensitivities in terms of protected areas, nature reserves, uh, your heritage sites, all the necessary buffers have been added to the data set. Excellent. Uh, Janet is asking if the system will identify to the users if you need a scoping EIA or BAR. No, the system doesn't look at activities at all. It doesn't look at the process that you should apply. It just looks at environmental sensitivity um, and then the classification, which also doesn't link to uh, specific activities. It looks at the development time. Uh, is the tool in development phase or is it full functionality at this stage? The tool is in full functionality at this stage and is available for voluntary use uh, to any of the users. Uh, Bridget, we would also like users to use the system and to provide feedback because once we get the feedback, we'd be able to know when we could make the usability 
and if there are any problems, um, and then we would be able to determine when it should become compu for compulsory use. If we don't get any feedback, we would think that everything is fantastic, um, and then make it com for compulsory use. So um, feedback is necessary in order for us to determine if it's working, uh, if there are things that people need and don't understand, or if things aren't working for them in certain in certain aspects of, of the tool. Uh, Justin is asking about the listed activity under SDFs and that it relates to conservation use. Will the SDF layer be able to define these areas specifically? Um, uh, so uh, again, we, we are not looking at listed activities. Um, the spatial development frameworks are also not currently on the on the screening tool. Um, they don't hold much. Uh, yeah, they don't hold much environmental data at this point. Uh, what we do or we could have is the de um, the industrial development zones. Uh, we can get access to those. I think we don't have them yet on the on the orientation layer, but it is one of the the listed uh, layers that we do need to access. And if there are other development uh, zones that people want us to add, it is just really a matter of getting those uh, those layers and, and including them. So um, I think, again, it would be really good for us to get feedback from the users to find out what else should go on in terms of information. Bridget, it also adds to the fact that the data sets currently in the system, as I mentioned during the demonstration on nationally uh, the national data sets, so we tried to provide a wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, in the case of the listing notices, you have differences between provinces, for example, and we have to actually look into those differences and the quality of the data in order to, at maybe a later stage, to also add all that data in a spatial format. There's a couple questions about whether the tool includes a variety of data. One asks about GDARD and CPLAN, and another asks if the data from CFM is included. Okay. So, so basically, Bridget, what happened is, um, as mentioned earlier, we we uh, the data sets that we got, we got it from the from the relevant custodians. So for for agriculture data, we went to DAF and. Um, if provinces want to get their data in, I think they need to liaise with the national uh, custodians who are responsible for agriculture. So we went with agriculture related data set, not provincial, because obviously uh, national is in charge or basically they're the custodians of uh, national data sets. So uh, we basically only went to, uh, to the custodians of the data set. There could be improvements in the data, but I think uh, provincial departments need to liaise with the custodians in order to get their good data into the national data set. And once that update is done, uh, we're more than welcome to include that into the national screening tool. Are protected area expansion strategy areas in the different provinces included in the screening tool? No, not expansion strategies. Uh, they've not included in, 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 this, in the screening tool because basically uh, it's terrestrial biodiversity and aquatic biodiversity. So those are our protected areas. We didn't include the expansion strategy in, in those themes. They don't really have any legal status yeah. at the moment. So um, it, it wouldn't be possible for us to restrict data. Um, but uh, I think there is already a, a kilometer, five kilometer from protected areas, which is just the current uh, uh, flag for, for consideration. Will the system suggest for you what type of specialist studies will be required for your application? Yes, it does. Um, in the report that Dion showed you, there was a, a list there. Um, it does tell you what specialist reports would be required, and then it would be up to the environmental practitioner to identify why they wouldn't do those, and then also to provide the motivation in, the, in, in, in for example, for photographs or whatever, if they are not required um, otherwise, they they would be uh, they would be required, and they would certainly need to be discussed, um, and probably a compliance statement uh, provided for for those. But a compliance statement is not an assessment as such; it's just an undertake. Well, it's a it's it's a confirmation from a specialist that um, 
that the situation is as um, as it, it's shown or it's uh, different and therefore they don't need to do an assessment. Uh, Lusanda has a follow-up question. So when you say the tool does not consider activity, does that mean it is sensitivity to any development regardless of the activity associated risk or rather impact? Uh, yes, there, there, there are two parts to the screening tool. The first one is only sensitivity based, so that's correct in terms of what what the, the, the lady asked. Um, but then they also uh, uh, development, uh, they also consider the development type. So for example, a wind turbine, uh, you would definitely need to do a bird and bat study, whereas for um, the example that Dion raised, which is a, a, um, a, a lodge, you, you're not going to be disturbing or your project wouldn't be colliding with birds. So a bird study would not be identified for that kind of activity. So it is based on environmental sensitivity, plus also the possible impacts that a development type would have. Um, Margaret's asking uh, regarding the original data layers, are the metadata and technical data reports available? For example, data integrity, management outcomes, etc. So basically on the original data set that, that we received, uh, the custodians have are responsible for the metadata. Some of the data sets have metadata uh, that we received from the original data set. Others don't have. If the custodians didn't provide the data, we, we didn't, uh, it's not part of the, of the screening tool. Okay. Um, a few more questions have been coming in. Um, I think we may have answered this, but just another question recently asking for clarification on how often the data set will be updated in the environmental screening tool to reflect the actual status on site. Okay, Bridget, um, as mentioned earlier, we, we just finished with, uh, with the data uh, conditioning and we're going to release the tool for voluntary use. Um, I think the DIA team will sit down and, and plan ahead, uh, basically schedule when the updates are going to be done. Because uh, obviously the we're going to have to look at the best practice maybe um, every few months if we can co contact the custodians, have some sort of agreement with them. Once your data is um, updated, please uh, liaise with us and on a quarterly basis. We haven't really taken a decision on that, but uh, it's a decision that needs to be taken. And it's obviously going to, we're going to enter into agreements with the data custodians just to ensure we have the, the latest data set. And uh, we will come up with a release schedule as soon as we have, um, uh, you know, up, uh, updated data sets, we're going to have to update the screening tool. But uh, uh, right at the moment, we, we don't have any schedule of updates for, for any data. Okay, so we do have time for one last question. Um, and one person is asking when a report ID created on behalf of a client, when a report ID is created on behalf of a client, can they use the map on their company template, ensuring that he references the map as it was generated on the tool and not taking ownership at all? Um, I, I think, Bridget, the, the, the information that is provided in the, in the report, it is not able to be manipulated in any way. So um, it, it's generated from the screening, screening process, and the only things you can manipulate is the front page in terms of the pictures and the logos and, of course, your project information. But um, there's no manipulation of, of the document so that we can ensure that that's as it was in terms of the screening tool um, and nobody's leaving anything out uh, which is expedient um, to them. So it is a base, basically uh, a motivation as to why you wouldn't have to do something rather than leaving out um, a sensitivity. Just Great. To add, Go um, ahead. To, to add to that, uh, if the user uh, intended to download data um, of from the screening tool and then use that data set in the, his own software to actually generate a map and then put it back into the uh, screening tool. Um, the report is still required and that's what a competent authority or a case officer would be looking at as the data that is coming from the screening tool. However, when Dion uh, showcased that one can actually generate a map, uh, if the user does have his additional data that he wants to add uh, to 
the current data set that does lie within the screen too. He can add his data as Dion indicated uh, on your left hand side and he can then generate his own maps within the screening tool instead of pulling out the data and generating his own maps in his own uh, templates. So, so I think also just to say that you can add additional information to your assessment. So um, that and that would be of course required because the the screening tool is just a flag, and then you still need to do your assessment and add any information or changes uh, that 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 you are seeing and make a sense of of the information on the site uh, in your own uh, report. Fantastic. Thank you all uh, for answering all of those questions. There were still many we didn't get to. I want to say that the presenters from the DEA will receive um, copies of all of the questions and comments that were presented to the system, whether they were answered live or not. And they are working to put together a comments and response document to make available. Uh, they have an existing FAQ type of document. And so they plan to use the questions that they've received today to add to and enhance that document. Is there anything you wanted to say about that? Um, that I didn't already mention? Uh, no, Bridget, I think that's correct. Uh, we will look at all those questions that have come in and we will include them in the uh, comments and responses document that we're preparing. That document will be put onto the website uh, when it becomes, uh, well, we'll we, we, yeah, when it becomes compulsory, we will add that document and the responses to the website. Um, but we will also consider all of these comments uh, in the work that we will take forward and the timeframes for compulsory use. Excellent. Well, I just want to remind everyone who participated that when you leave, you will receive a link to a very brief survey and we hope that you will take just a few moments to uh, complete that. It will provide additional information to both uh, DEA and IAI and IAI South Africa. That would be very helpful to us as we move forward with webinars. You will also receive a recording to the link our link to the recording of this webinar in a couple days. And so um, please feel free to watch that or share it. Um, and uh, it will be on a link to a YouTube recording. And so thank you so much to the presenters from DEA to II South Africa, specifically Sue George, for being the driving force to getting this put together. And uh, to all of you who participated and made it such a fantastic webinar, uh, we know that your time is valuable. We hope that this was valuable to you as well. See you next time.